Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. It's the date of his dreams, and Tom McHugh really wants to put his best foot forward. Um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Unfortunately, tonight, Tom's got two left feet, too many women, and too many enemies. Oh, hell's breaking this man up. Mystery date. The first date is the worst date. Tom, I'm up into your face. It's all red. Sneak preview Sunday, August 11th, rated PG-13. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie Mystery Date from 1991. The studio was Orion Pictures, the release date was August 16th, 1991. The running time, 97 minutes, and it's rated PG-13. Couldn't find the numbers for the budget, but the box office took in $6.1 million, making it the 116th ranked movie of 1991. Roger Ebert at the time gave it 2 out of 4 stars, and here's his review. Here is a moronic comedy that plays like nothing so much as an exercise written for a TV sitcom class. Only the energy levels of the actors prevent it from being a complete loss. And believe me, it's a close call. It's one of those movies where the setup is unbelievably complicated and involves a chain of mistaken identities. And we sit patiently in the audience and wait while the writers get all their ducks in a row. All right, I'm going to remove some of the plot points since that's my job. And then we go to Mystery Date provides us with the characters we don't believe, doing things that we don't care about in a universe of total manipulation. Those observations would not bother me in the least if the movie were funny, but it is not. Now, I like some of the moments, like Fisher Stevens as the flower man and Terry Polo's sweetness at dinner on the blind date, but otherwise the movie is a void. All right, here's another example where Ebert Someone who was middle-aged at the time really isn't the target audience for this film. This was a film for teenagers, like I was in 1991, and I actually saw this film as a double feature at the drive-in. I believe the main feature being the original Hot Shots with Charlie Sheen. And if I remember correctly, I think my dad barely got through Hot Shots, which of course I enjoyed because it was satire, just like Airplane and Naked Gun. And then he totally bailed a mystery date halfway through. So I would have to rent it on VHS many months later to find out how it actually ended. Now, I will agree with parts of Ebert's review in the sense of that the film is a bit of a bait and switch. It seems like an 80s romantic comedy, but it's really not that type of film at all, as we'll get into. All right, let's get into the main cast. So you have Ethan Hawke, who plays Tom McHugh. And part of the reason Mystery Date was intriguing to me was partly due to the film Explorers from 1985, which I loved and watched repeatedly. And that's what Ethan Hawke's film debut was. Now, four years later, he was in the really critically acclaimed film Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams. Then in 1991, he was in the adaptation of the Jack London classic White Fang. Terry Polo plays Gina Matthews. Even though this would be the first film I saw Polo in, she would be best known for playing Ben Stiller's fiance in Meet the Parents. Mystery Date was her film debut, and she did the bulk of her work on TV shows like the soap opera Loving and was a regular character on the last season of Northern Exposure. The director, Jonathan Wax. Now, this would be Wax's best-known film as a director, though he was the producer of the cult classic Repo Man from 1984 with Emilio Estevez. Now, Mystery Date does have a number of fun character actors like Fisher Stevens, whom I enjoyed in Short Circuit and My Science Project, and you have B.D. Wong, who is a mainstay on TV shows like Law & Order, SVU, and Mr. Robot, and Brian McNamara, who was also in Short Circuit as Ali Sheedy's asshole boyfriend who gets beat up by Johnny Five. He was in many other things, but that's the first time I saw him. Okay, let's get into the movie. So it begins with the standard opening credits, but with a phone call between Tom McHugh, Ethan Hawke, and his brother Craig, played by Brian McNamara. Tom is describing the girl he's infatuated with named Gina, that's Terry Polo, whom he made eye contact with at the beach. But, of course, Tom was actually too shy to go over and talk to her. Tom's parents are throwing a party and he's mingling with the various adults. Tom is not thrilled with his parents' plan for him, which involves becoming a doctor or a lawyer like his successful brother. Now, I believe Tom is a senior in high school or just about to graduate. And actually, his parents seem more proud of their dog (laughs) than Tom. As you all know, by this time tomorrow, Betty and I will be in Connecticut 
along with a very special member of our family. Here, here. here. For the past four years, he's competed among the very best our nation has had to offer, and each time he's come home a champion. And I know how grateful he is for your generous support. But I think he can probably say it a lot more eloquently than I. So what do you say, champ? <laughs> Now, as it turns out, Gina is Tom's next-door neighbor. I wouldn't say Tom is stalking her, but he definitely wants to know more about her in order to make a good impression with her. Tom's parents leave for the weekend to go to the dog show. This leaves Tom the chance to make his move and have the entire house to himself. However, plans quickly change when his brother shows up in his cherished 1959 DeSoto fire sweep. Actually, the more I think about it, yeah, Tom is actually stalking Gina. I mean, he took out the trash in order to learn more about her. However, this is an early 90s romantic comedy. It's it's not supposed to be creepy. So just suspend disbelief for all you Gen Zers out there. No need to make a TikTok video about mystery date issues. Hey, you got her phone number? Greg, I don't even know her name. But you've got her garbage, right? Got a couple of gourmet lights. Coos, coos, a bunch of grapefruit rinds. Tommy, you gotta get this girl some food. Hello. Tom, I'd like you to meet Gina Matthews. In July, Gina bought $85 worth of lingerie at Nordstrom. Very nice. You like lingerie, Tommy? Well, I've really only read about it. All right, let's see. She, uh, she reads mystery novels to escape, right? Yeah. She dreams of faraway exotic places. She's into surrealism. She's trapped, huh? Bingo. She plays bingo? Phone bill. Now we have her phone number. Let's go rescue her. Greg. No, 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 I can't do this. Just be yourself. No, uh, I, I can't. Then be me. No. Hello? Hello? Hello, Gina? Is this Gina Matthews? Hi, my name is Tom. Uh, no, no, Tom McHugh. Well, that's because we've never met. I'm a neighbor of yours. I live over on Sunnydale. <laughs> I don't name the streets. I just live on them. Listen, I keep seeing you everywhere I go. First it was at Nordstrom, and then the beach, and then at that uh, Dolly exhibit over at the museum. And I had to call to ask you to please, please stop following me around. I mean, people are really starting to talk. Oh, you know, us. Uh, listen, Gina, to be totally honest with you, I'm trying my hardest to ask you out. But it's gonna be a beautiful night. It's gonna be one of those hot, tropical nights where anything could happen. Well, I fly back to California tomorrow Dad, listen, what about this? What if I just show up at your house at 7.30 and if you don't open the door, I'll go home. I promise. What do you say? Great. Bye. We're in. I'm not going to do this. You can call her back. Call her back. Do what? Now all you have to do is show up. No. What if I blow it? This is way too spontaneous. I need more time. Tiger, tiger. Come on, come on, come on. All right, relax. Trust me, you'll be ready. 
Now, I want you to just remember what Lord Olivier said about acting, okay? The key is sincerity. Once you can fake that, the rest is easy. George Burns said that. So Craig takes Tom to a fancy salon to get his hair styled and then shopping to get a new wardrobe. Tom is so insecure about blowing this date that he just listens to his smooth-talking brother's advice. One of the side characters in the film is a flowery delivery guy named Dwight, that's Fisher Stevens, who is sort of the comic relief in the sense that his life is a comedy of errors. For example, he delivers the flowers late for Tom's date and Craig doesn't give him a tip. And then while backing the delivery van from the driveway, he instead backs into the limo pulling into the driveway that was supposed to drive Tom and Gina. Instead of stopping, he drives away. (laughs) The limo company calls Tom to tell him about the accident and that it will be another few hours before a replacement car is sent. Panicked and pissed, Tom decides to improvise and decides to take his brother's prize to Soto for the date, even though Craig said he could not. Tom pulls up to Gina's house but initially forgets to set the emergency brake. Luckily, the car doesn't roll far before he stops it manually. Hi. You're Tom? I'm Tom. (laughs) These are flowers, Dad. Good for you. Okay, well, I could put them in some water. Yeah, just the bottom part. <laughs> Listen, thanks for the flowers. They were really great. Um, but I'm going to ask you a few questions before I open the door. Right, right, of course. I understand. Okay. Tell me the name of the last novel you actually read. Novel? Yeah, big storybook without pictures. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just that it was, um, it was this mystery novel, you know, Saratoga Longshot. Are you kidding? I just, I just read that. Really? Okay, um, what's a couple of Paraguay? Uruguay? No, it's Ascension. But nobody ever gets that one. (laughs) Um, any personal heroes? Uh, uh, I always kind of looked up to my older brother, Craig. But that's kind of stupid. (laughs) Really? That's so sweet. I mean, most guys say Michael Jordan. (laughs) So Tom's garbage collecting paid off, and they're off on their date. Gina makes a funny remark about a past date that showed up in a limo and how ridiculous it was. So far, so good for Tom. First stop is dinner at a Caribbean restaurant. Gina loves it. Gina is not only beautiful, but very down-to-earth, which relaxes Tom. That is until he spills his drink all over himself, much to his horror. Again, Gina is very sweet about Tom's clumsiness. What Tom doesn't realize is that by driving Craig's car and using his credit card and his tab at the restaurant comes unforeseen baggage, like having an unruly character go through his car in the parking lot. Tom also gets slapped by a woman who thinks he is Craig. Instead of hanging around for more surprises, Tom decides quickly to leave the restaurant with Gina. So even though he evades a jilted woman and her large male friends, Tom also has to deal with Dwight, the pissed off flower delivery guy that Craig stiffed. Uh Uh-oh, are these your buddies again? Yeah, they're all over the place. Sure yet? What? Did you get her drunk with my tip money? Bang! What did he say? I didn't catch it. Ah! 
kind of funny, wasn't he? After avoiding Dwight, Tom stops for gas, but is being followed by a guy that went through the car while they were at the restaurant. As it turns out, the guy is a detective named Al Condon, played by Jerry Wasserman, and he's looking to arrest Craig. So while Gina goes to the restroom, the detective tells Craig to open the trunk. To both of their surprise, a dead body holding a machine gun is in the trunk. Tom panics and quickly closes the trunk, and somehow the trunk door hits the machine gun, and it goes off and shoots the detective dead. Tom, of course, panics and dumps the detective into the trunk with the other body. Gina comes back to the car, none the wiser, and is having a great time on the date so far with Tom. Tom calls his house and leaves a message on the recorder for Craig. Hi, I'm Richard. Hi, Daddy. And that was Napoleon. We're not home right now, but if you leave your name and number, we'll call you back just as soon as we can. Craig, are you there? Pick up the phone, okay? Oh, shit. Um... Uh, listen, listen, I had to borrow your car. This st stupid limo didn't show up. Uh, all hell's breaking loose, man. Uh, I, I, have, I have two dead bodies in the truck, you know, and, and I think I should call the police, you know, but I, but I, I can't because, because one of them is I, I personally I accidentally killed, and you know, the captains have been slapped. I've been threatened by goons. I've been attacked by a freaking florist, okay? We haven't even ordered appetizers, all right? Uh, you said something about old hangouts. You meet, meet me at a place called Club Voltaire if you're not already there, okay? Uh, all right. See you there. Bye. Well, the flowers are a great surprise. I can't wait to see what you'll do next. Next? Uh... It's another surprise. Just after Tom and Gina leave, a tow truck arrives, towing Dwight's damaged flower truck. Dwight notices a hat on the ground in a pool of blood. Now, this was the detective's hat. He picks it up, and just as he does, the police backup arrives that the detective called in. Now, if it wasn't for bad luck, Dwight wouldn't have any luck at all. In the meantime, Tom decides to take Gina to a club, which just happens to have the metal band Guar performing. And if you don't know Guar, well, they put on the craziest stage show ever. Listen, Gina, I'm really sorry. I thought my brother might that be here. That was incredible! I thought we were going to get killed! Well, the night is still young. Bottle your best champagne. Back at Tom's house, the police are ransacking the place looking for clues and the whereabouts of Craig. Though everyone thinks that Tom is Craig since now he sort of looks like him due to his makeover. Now as a viewer, you're starting to get why Craig was so helpful to Tom to begin with. The police also hear the message on the answer machine from Tom in which he mentioned about the two dead bodies. Tom is getting deeper and deeper in trouble with every minute. We go back to the club and Tom gets slapped again by another woman who thinks he's Craig. Tom finds out from the bartender that Craig is at the club and is upstairs. Tom goes to look for Craig and finds yet another dead body. He takes a piece of paper from the dead guy's hand and quickly leaves. Gina again is super cool and having a great time with Tom on the date. They have a quick moment and are about to kiss when a police officer arrives and asks if the DeSoto is his car. Tom nervously confirms it is, and the officer says that he's missing a tire, as it was stolen while they were in the club. The very kind police officer offers to change the tire, but Tom quickly realizes that the spare is in the trunk, and that would be a bad idea to let the cop view this, since two dead bodies are also in the trunk. Tom gets a tire, and the officer puts it on the car. There's a quick panic moment when Tom attempts to drive away, and the officer notices the blood on the pavement from the dead bodies that are leaking from the trunk. But luckily, he thinks the blood is transmission fluid, and Tom lucks out again. The police who went through Tom's house then went to the club where Tom and Gina were at, and they discovered the dead bodies upstairs. As it turns out, the body that Tom found was the head of the Chinese Tong Mafia. So the cops think that Craig slash Tom is a complete psycho on a killing spree. 
While walking around Chinatown, Tom and Gina are forced to go into a restaurant owned by James Liu, played by B.D. Wong, who again thinks Tom is Craig. So, how do you know this, Mr. Liu? I don't. You see, this is, this is a misunderstanding. He knows my brother, and I don't think he likes him. And you know how when you don't like somebody, you kind of, you don't like their whole family, right? What I'm trying to say is I don't think, uh, I don't think Lou brought us here to serve us dinner. Your dinner, compliments of Mr. Lou. I got you, baby. Hold it. Hold it. It could be dangerous. At the very least, he's not going to be a very congenial host. Picking up. Our house specialty. If you require anything else, food, drink, additional companions, anything at all, please don't hesitate to ask. Your money is no good here. Let me put it another way. You know, and I probably should have said this before, but I think he wants to kill us. What, with MSG? No, I'm not kidding. Okay. I just feel a whole lot better if we just got out of here. Wait a minute, Tom. You said yourself that this is just some big misunderstanding. I mean, why don't you get a hold of your brother and find out what's going on? It's simple. It's what I've been trying to do. Maybe I should try him again. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay. Tom tries to call the house again, but now the house phone is being monitored and recorded by the police. And they know now that he's at Lou's restaurant. When Tom returns to the table, James Lou is at the table. Thank you. Well, I hope you don't mind. I've taken the liberty of introducing myself to your lovely companion. At last we meet. You're, uh different than I imagined. Thanks. Uh, Lou? Mr. Lou? Uh, James Lou. I hope you're enjoying your meal. May I join you? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, this is a really great place you have, James. So, it seems we share many interests. Beautiful women, exotic cars, Manchurian vases of the late 16th century. Oh, right. Uh, I just I just saw an article on, on your collection. Ah, you read. Then you know how valuable some of those vases can be. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, it's, it's funny because just today I heard a, a proverb about... Vases, or um, actually, it's about a pot. It's about this really poor guy who gets this pot from his uncle or his. Grandpa. I know the proverb. Oh well. Oh well, I know. What's it about? It, it just basically says, "Always look inside the pot." Or uh, and and this is just my interpretation, but uh, uh, shake it up every now and then and see if there's any money in it. You know. <laughs> Oh, so now it's money you're after. Only yesterday you were begging me to spare your life. And we made a deal, thank you. Deal? What's he talking about? Oh, you see, I'm not the guy you made the deal with. I'm, I'm, I'm not Craig McHugh. He's, he's my brother. Mm. Let me guess. Your evil twin brother, right? <laughs> Where is it? Where is my boss? Listen, McHugh. I've been cutting you a lot of slack. I have not held you accountable for whole Wong's accident because I like you. 
Did you know that he killed my cousin, Ho Wong? Well, it's our first day. We haven't had a lot of time to open up to each other. Mm. He's modest. He told me it was all in self-defense. Fine. I understand. I guess he was probably sent to kill you in the first place anyway. <laughs> Come to think of it. But Mr. McHugh, enough is enough. Don't you realize who you're dealing with here? <laughs> Don't you know that you will never leave this restaurant alive unless you return my property? Tell him you're not Craig. <laughs> what the heck is your problem? Hey, hey, everybody! It's it's Mr. Lou's birthday. Okay. It's a happy birthday to you. It's Mr. Lou's birthday. With that quick thinking subterfuge, Tom and Gina are able to quickly escape the restaurant while the staff and patrons gather around Lou. And right as they drive away, the police arrive at the restaurant. So Tom comes clean to Gina, and things don't go as planned, of course. Look, all I know is it's got something to do with this vase that belongs to Lou. And I think that Craig might have... I think he stole it. Right, and all these cops show up just because your brother still seems yeah, I don't know. Face. I don't know. The last time I knew, my brother was at Stanford becoming a lawyer. And now I find out he's here, he's stealing vases, he's pissing off girls. I mean, God knows what he was thinking when he set up this stupid date. Craig set up this date? Wait a minute, it was Craig who called me? You know, I expect most guys to lie about something. How much they've been to press, how many girls that they've slept with, what they expect out of a relationship, but... But you've created an alternate parallel universe. Look, uh... I wanted to call you from the first time I saw you. It was just too important a thing for me to screw up by saying something stupid. I just wanted to make a good first impression. Come on, Tom, that's the idea, you know, to cut through all of that. Find out if there's anything worthwhile, you know, on the inside. No, look in the pot. What? The proverb, remember? I, I found it in the loft above the Club Voltaire's. It was a message from my brother. A message? Wait. Wait, Tom, you know what that means, don't you? Yeah, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's, uh... <laughs> beauty's in the inside. No, 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 no. Look, it means that... that whatever this guy Lou is after is inside this vase that Craig has. Look in the pot, right? You're right. I've gotta... I've gotta find Craig. Wait, wait, wait. What is this? What is this? Still no answer. Here, I have an idea. When I was in retail, there was a special number we could use to verify phone numbers on checks. We can get his address this way. Yes, um, 555-1809, Craig McHugh. Yeah. 2856 West Eastwood. Great, thanks. So, let's go meet your perfect older brother. All right, there's a little over 30 minutes left in the film. So will Tom and Gina find Craig, or will they remain in grave danger? And what exactly is the end game for Craig? 
<laughs> oh yeah, and don't forget about the crazy florist, Dwight. I can tell you the outcome is as wacky as you can imagine. And while this film might seem like a typical late 80s and early 90s romantic comedy, it's more of a mystery thriller that you might enjoy. So check it out. Don't listen to Ebert on this one. All right, no fun facts for making this film. There's not a lot out there. So that's why you have this podcast. And I'll be back next week to talk about yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.